Hello everyone. I'm glad to see you on my channel. The story I'm going to tell you today is pure. It is true that all the bad things that happen in life happen for a reason. It is said that we can appreciate the good things, the things when they happen to us. I hope you enjoy this story. I wish you a pleasant viewing experience. December that year was unusual. First, for a whole week, a whole wall of heavy snow fell. It blocked the road between the orphanage and the outside world for a while. Even the all-powerful Frederick on his bus couldn't get over the drifts that covered the dirt road. He didn't try. At some point, the wall of snow became so thick that nothing could be seen. Finally, the snow ended, and under its weight the century-old spruce trees leaned almost to the ground. And then Martha and other girls and pupils, together with the head teacher and the driver, and the mothers of the educators came out to fight. For several days in a row, they wielded shovels, trowels, and scrapers. Residents of the Blackbird collected huge mountains of snow, on which then with pleasure rolled kids. But as soon as this hard labor was over, the warmth came and everything began to melt. Now it was difficult to walk from the bedrooms to the school building because of the ice. Toward the end of December, the clouds thickened again. Everyone hoped that this new year would be snowy and beautiful. They dressed up a huge fluffy Christmas tree in the yard and hung the toys they had made themselves. Frederick managed to put a star on the top of the tree from a high ladder. After the snowfall, after working together with the children, after decorating the tree, Martha had a feeling that soon her life would change. Soon she would finally have the home she had always dreamed of. The principal demanded when he saw eight-year-old Marta with a mop. Three stronger. The girl had never heard a kind word from him in her life. The director had to be addressed only by his patronymic and as respectfully as possible. The degree of compliance with the second requirement he determined himself and was rarely satisfied. True, he conveyed indignation with words and used only humane punishments. His favorite method of influence on disobedient children was weaning them off gadgets when they were forbidden to use phones and tablets. The director had long ago noticed that the fear of losing access to the internet was very strong for the younger generation. In some ways, he shared it himself. Okay, John, the criticism is understandable. Martha replied obediently, wringing out the rag. I'll wash it and polish it. What? No respect. The principal was indignant and then, lowering his voice, he added, I'll see you at my place tonight for our lesson, understand? Having said this, he left for his office. Despite the disgusting character of John, his approach to education deserved respect. If in other orphanages boys and girls did not do anything themselves, then in the Blackbird on the contrary from a young age accustomed to labor. They cooked, cleaned, picked fruits and vegetables. John always said, you're not children, you're little adults. My job is to make sure you don't lose yourselves on the way to old age, to stop being a burden, to stop being freeloaders. Only in labor and striving to become a better person hardens like a clay pot in the oven. Even in the Blackbird could not do without staff. That's why here, in addition to the ten mothers of educators, there were two cleaners, a storekeeper and a driver. Teachers came. They never stayed in the classrooms after 15 o'clock. Frederick took the older children to the local school by bus. Martha couldn't wait until she was big enough to go. She enjoyed the trips. The principal was always emphasizing that he was the only one in the orphanage with nothing but idlers and idlers, wastrels and lazy people. John was the official guardian of each boy and girl, and only he decided, quite officially, which of them could have a chance at foster parents. For as long as she could remember, Martha had always wanted a family. She knew from scraps of information from her caregivers that she'd had a mom and dad, sort of, until she was two years old. What happened after that, they never told her. John attributed it to child welfare. It's too early for you to know these things, he said whenever the girl started this conversation. When? When will I be able to find out? Martha asked. At such moments tears began to choke her, but she held back. Soon, replied the headmaster. Soon, but not now. Most of the foster families were very young children of two or three years old. They appear here all year round, without any system, but they were always few in number. According to John's cunning plan, his pupils were also to prove themselves as nannies. Martha and her classmates also babysat, fed and changed diapers. While some found these activities humiliating, the girl liked to play with the children, dressing and feeding them as if she were having fun with a big doll. 
But these were the kind of kids who didn't stay at the orphanage for long. They probably didn't even have time to realize what had happened to them. Martha had so much hope for December because it was a time of miracles. It was not without reason that she was constantly offered to make a wish, to write a letter to Santa Claus, to read fortunes. In general, if anything could change in her life, it was only now, on New Year's Eve. The only time that the orphanage seemed to be quite bearable. Volunteers and clowns came to visit, played New Year's games, held contests, had a bubble show, and taught them how to draw. It was all great, of course, but Martha wanted something else. She wanted to come home, walk to her bedroom, and dress up the little Christmas tree with her parents. Therefore, in a letter to Santa Claus, whose existence she did not doubt for a second, the girl once again diligently deduced. Dear Grandpa, I want Mom, Dad, and Brother. P.S. and a new cell phone, because the old one started to run out of battery quickly. At the end of December, with an unprecedented snowfall, school vacations began, which means that there will be no classes for two whole weeks. Teachers would be able to rest from negligent students, which included Martha. The grades for the semester were not high, but the girl did not understand why she needed others. The New Year's Eve rush is a completely different story. Along with clowns and volunteers, potential moms and dads will visit the Blackbird shelter. They will look at the children, talk and play with them, and then they will take the best ones for themselves. A classmate named Harry used another word for perspective. You'll either be picked up right away when you're a puppy, Harry said, or they'll keep you here forever. Why? Martha asked at such times. Harry, who was almost 10 years old now, seemed extremely intelligent and experienced. Because neither you nor I are promising. And grown-ups only want people like you. You know, obedient and not upsetting and all that. Harry's version of future moms and dads didn't seem like a lot. Perhaps she could listen to her future parents and certainly wouldn't upset them. Martha didn't even know why there was almost no interest in her. Well, there had been interest. For as long as she could remember, uncles and aunts who came to the orphanage had enjoyed playing with her. Many were interested in her hobbies, her studies, and other things. But in the presence of strangers, she was timid and could not answer anything. Only mooed and nodded. And once she even fainted. The director was never tactful and bluntly told the guests, pay no attention to her, she is behind in her development. But we still love her even like this. While Blackbird experienced the New Year's Eve fuss, the mood of the mistress of a cozy Moscow apartment was depressed. That year Selina decided not to put up a Christmas tree, not to write a letter to Santa Claus and not even turn on the TV. Her man took to the choice with understanding. He himself could not stand this holiday, although she did not go into details. Selina's misadventures had been going on for years. When she returned from her year-long trip around the world, she was horrified to learn that maybe her older sister had died. No one had called to tell her the sad news. No one had told her the details. She had to learn everything from the police and the investigating committee. Lately, they had not been particularly friendly. Their views on life were turned 180 degrees apart. But there was also something that could unite. After all, her sister still had a daughter, Merle. During her lifetime, Nadi had not allowed Selena to spend time with her child, canceling her visits under various pretexts. Even when the baby wasn't well, she refused to help, but at least she called occasionally and sent pictures. She and Mady had no one left, no cloaks or distant relatives, but they had mutual friends. Those of them who tried to get in touch with the girl and could not, thought that she was simply not interested in the life and death of her sister. The reason for the silence was prosaic. The girl was in the remote mountains without any communication with the outside world. Although the feeling of anxiety in those days did not leave her, now Selena blamed herself for embarking on such a long journey of self-discovery and losing Myrtle as a result. At night she imagined that the girl was lying next to her on her crib and telling her something in her childish language. When the girl returned to her native country and recovered from the first shock, she immediately began to look for her niece. But by a strange coincidence, no one could find her. At first, they refused to provide information, citing personal data. You have different surnames, said one official at a personal reception. Do you have any of your sister's documents? Copies? No, answered Selena. It took her a year to confirm her relationship to Mati. They shared the same mother, but different fathers and surnames. Then came the endless circles of bureaucratic hell. Selena, an artist and designer, could not master this strange language, 
which was supposed to talk to officials, and they were not in a hurry to make a step towards her and help her grief. Where were you for a whole year after your sister's death? The woman from the education department asked angrily. Why did you come running at once? I was out of the country, answered Selena. You see, the official shouted. Are you sure you want this? What if you want to leave the country for a year again? You must find her, Selena whispered. She was immediately timid in the face of such pressure. She couldn't just disappear without a trace. We have 400,000 orphans in this country. The woman continued to rebuke her. Do I have to check every one of them? Then she received two consecutive rejections. The girl with Murph Lansky's data was not registered in the orphan registration system. What does that mean? Anything. Lost, mistaken, withheld, adopted. The information is confidential and will not be released. Every failure made Selena feel disappointed and sob. Had the girl really been adopted, given a new first and last name? Wouldn't she even be able to hold her hand and teach her anything important? The child should be eight years old by now. Her last attempt to find her niece was two years ago. After that, Selena didn't feel strong enough to keep looking. But recently a man with the most romantic profession on earth, a private investigator, appeared in her life. He supported her in her reluctance to create a New Year's mood, but put a surprise under the tree. Darling, he said with a smile, I've done everything I can and can't do. And by golly, there was some light at the end of the tunnel. Turns out Anthony hadn't just been listening to her endless story about losing her niece, he'd been constantly gathering information bit by bit. In a matter of months, using authorized and unauthorized techniques, he did what took her years to find traces of her niece. There's, you know, a rather strange orphanage, Anthony said, experimental or something. Can you believe it? There's hardly any staff. Is my niece there? Selena asked hopefully. I don't want you to make a big deal out of it, he admitted frankly. I have a full list of children here, as you can see. If anyone finds out, my license will be in tears. So you don't tell anybody. There's no Myrtle Lansky, but there is a Martha Linsky. What if it's a coincidence? There's only one way to find out, Anthony said. We have to get in there somehow and find out. After all, you're a close relative. You're supposed to get it. Oh, love, if only it were that easy. They have an open house next week, the private investigator said thoughtfully. It's a long drive, of course, but if we go right now, we can make it. I don't know if I'm ready, Selena whispered. What if it doesn't work out again? What if I'm disappointed again? If someone had asked her, what's your name, grandmother? She would have thought about it for at least five minutes. What is it, really? In her 70s, the cleaner of the orphanage Blackbird was full of strength and energy, although she sometimes forgot her name. It's a joke, under her command several dozen pupils. True, she did not have to build them in a line and teach them something it was enough to accept the work of cleaning the premises. It was a simple craft, but very much in demand. It seemed to Betty that the children were very fond of her. In fact, boys and girls can be strict too. Behind their eyes they called Vasilyevna a funny nickname Flying Dutchman, the most ill-mannered joke that the elderly janitor was already counting absences in the cemetery. But she didn't know all this, didn't hear or notice, and therefore she had a wonderful opinion of her children. The only one who made her very uncomfortable was the principal, John. A 35-year-old man with no family or children, a career man, a passionate man. That's the kind of man that keeps the country going. He spent day and night at the orphanage, but the children never heard a kind word from him. He often snapped and shouted at them, believing that this was the most effective method of getting his message across. Recently, Betty witnessed this behavior again. If you behave like that, you'll go straight to juvenile detention. The principal reprimanded another boy. His whole crime was to sneak into the kitchen late at night and steal a bun, but he was spotted and caught by the storekeeper. Forgive me, 7-7, seven, seven, cried the little boy. I was just so hungry. What did you call me, you rascal? You'll have a lovely breakfast in the morning, the headmaster continued, and you had a great dinner tonight. Do you know that overeating is a sin? I'm cutting you off gadgets for a month, understand? You tell your mom the teacher, and I'll make sure she takes action, and we'll take this up with the council. Betty couldn't understand this strange ban on keeping sweets in the children's rooms. Her grandson, who had long since left school, could not live a day without marmalade, marshmallows, marshmallows and he grew up a normal person, never went to prison. But he didn't give up his childhood habits. He still craved something sweet. Betty. The director spoke loudly, 
though he tried to restrain his voice when addressing the old woman. You should be more careful, more careful. I found dust yesterday. Uh-huh, answered the grandmother. As you say, John, you are a golden man. I commend you for your respect, said the headmaster. But I would ask you to honor your duties. All the elderly cleaning lady did was to scrub the floors on the second floor, in the wing where there was a common hall and the director's offices. He occupied two of them, one for sleeping and one for working. When Betty went inside the living room, she couldn't believe her eyes. Did John's salary really allow for such luxury? The bedroom itself would be more suited to a hotel than an orphanage. For one thing, the room was really big. In the second place, during its repair and creation of comfort money was obviously not spared and not counted. Decorative painting of walls, stucco, air conditioner and other attributes of successful life. To open or close a window, it was supposed not to pull the handle, but to press the buttons of the remote control. If Betty had not been a cleaner in the orphanage, she would not have known that such a miracle of technology existed. In the corner was a single bed, but what a bed! To the left was a remote control, but no longer wired, that allowed you to adjust the softness, tilt, and several types of massage. A leather sofa with a perfect surface, an expensive coffee machine, a luxury wristwatch, a telescope, a huge laptop, headphones as different from a magazine page about the distant future, and also a shower cabin which resembled a spaceship escape pod, so many buttons on it. And all this was supposed to be wiped and cleaned with different rags and means. God forbid that one should mix it up. Betty, you're the only one I can trust, the director said to her. I can't trust anyone else, only you. You are a gold, not a human being, answered the cleaning lady. I'll do everything, don't doubt it. John loved flattery, but hated dust and dirt. If he saw a single spot, he could become furious. And when the coronavirus epidemic hit, the handmaster went mad with caution. For a whole year, he wouldn't let in volunteers or adopters. Maybe he was right about something. Betty herself was so sick, she almost gave her soul to God. After a month's absence, she returned to the orphanage and was amazed to see that both of the director's offices were pristinely clean. I asked one thing, Betty, he demanded. That no one, no one and never dare to come into my bedroom. You are responsible for it with your head. And who will come in, precious one? The cleaning lady asked. Who? The director was surprised. Children. They'll come in here and they'll mess everything up for sure. They will. That's how Betty lived her life, without remembering her name. There was no other work in the village anyway. Blackbird had built its nest 10 kilometers from the big city, not far from the forest and her native village. And even if she wasn't paid much, she still loved the orphanage and cried when she saw the children without parents. If I could, thought the cleaner, if I could I would take them all for myself. It's not bad here but it's better in my own house. Then Betty remembered that she was 70 years old and immediately calmed down. She filled a bucket with water, took not a mop, but a mop, not with a cloth, but with a fiber board, and went to clean the second floor. But one day, walking by the principal's office in the evening, she heard something that took her breath away and turned her face white. Wow, John, you're a golden man, thought the janitor, clutching at her heart. Martha could keep a secret. In their orphanage, if you said anything in confidence, you'd be laughed at. Kids don't know the difference between half domes. They either love with all their hearts or hate with all their souls. That's why she didn't have any close friends. If you tell someone a secret, the whole orphanage knows it tomorrow. You know something, Harry, she said one day, and Tim was looking at me and smiling. Really? The classmate smiled slyly. He looked at you like that? The next day, the whole orphanage called them bride and groom. Martha was ashamed of herself, but Harry rolled his eyes and told her that she hadn't discussed the subject with anyone. After the stories had been repeated several times, Martha realized that no one could be trusted. Rumors were like eyelashes caught in the eye. You could live, but it was unpleasant. A year ago, Martha had a secret. What a secret! Now she and John had one thing in common. Not often, not even every week, did he invite her into his office, but not one where any pupil could go. Martha was granted access to the Holy of Holies, the headmaster's bedroom. Like Bethy, she was struck by the beauty of the room. Officially, her evening visits to John's room were called self-discovery sessions. It began with the principal reprimanding Martha for being developmentally delayed, 
and he said it so often and so convincingly that the girl believed him. D's in math, he listed. C's in geography. English is barely a B. And that's just the writing classes. If it goes on like this, you'll go straight to the bar. Do you hear me? Marta had no idea what a panel was, and she was too embarrassed to ask. Her classes with the principal were no less strange than the mysterious word panel. He would show her videos on his huge laptop, let her look at the moon and stars through his telescope, and he'd tell her things, tell her things, tell her things. Even though Martha was just a little girl, she knew something was wrong. But with whom could she discuss the principal's strange pedagogy? He was the most important person in Blackbird's life, and she had no idea that she could complain to anyone about him and reveal their shared secret. John, she asked, working up the courage. Kathy had found relatives last week. Very far away, yes. Where? The handmaster asked, loadingly. Well, and what's his name? Sit down to. I told you to study geography. John was telling her off. Learn geography and math. Without them, you'll never get anywhere in life. And you'll end up, you know where you are? Okay, next. You let her look for relatives. Martha explained, her eyes downcast. What if I have them somewhere? No, said the director. You're an orphan, alone like the wind in the field. Alone like the star in the sky. Neighboring systems seem to be next to each other, but in fact they are light years apart. It would take a lifetime to get to the nearest one. And if you look for it, Martha went on, but not so confidently. It's a waste of time. The headmaster shouted. Come here, let's start our lesson. The girl blushed immediately. Here in the orphanage, she had a lot of school subjects. John treated the children like adults, which he didn't have time to repeat. And in addition to the usual math, English, geography, and other subjects, they had very interesting disciplines. Child's rights, for example. Or conflict, where they were taught to sort out the causes of quarrels and child fights. Or design, where an elderly woman taught them how to sew skirts, mittens and aprons. Or cooking where Martha pressed cookies with a mold and learned to make salads. But she'd never seen such strange teaching anywhere, and she suspected it was all wrong. John would give her some pill that made the world seem to go away, sit her down beside him, and say, Repeat after me, Martha. Repeat after me. The principals demand that she keep their lesson secret she would have kept to herself, and even if she wanted to tell someone, who would believe her? So she repeated the strange words of the director, although it made her heart feel heavy and bitter. Closer to New Year's Eve, the orphanage began to receive visitors, sponsors, volunteers, officials, and expectant mothers and fathers. They were all greeted by John, and it was as if he had been replaced by another person. On days like this, the principal was obliging, polite, very tactful and courteous. Martha loved this time because there were new faces in the orphanage, and she missed new faces. The girl wanted the guests to radiate joy and cheerfulness because there were those who shed tears and clutched their children to them, choking on their sobs. It is not pleasant if a stranger cries into your sweater and holds you so tightly, as if he wants to strangle you. Potential moms and dads always followed the sponsors, volunteers and officials. They looked at the babies, trying to find the right one, blushing and as if embarrassed. The prospective parents were always shy and hesitant. There were some that John literally had to lead by the hand. Others were afraid of children like fire, and others tried to talk to them as if they were dogs, and they were genuinely surprised if a little boy of three or four could meaningfully answer seemingly difficult questions. Once Martha overheard a conversation between a staid man in a handsome jacket and his wife with a pomaded face, 911. Look at that one, the head of the family said, pointing almost imperceptibly. He looks like me, don't you think? But we've always wanted a girl, objected the wife, pouting her lips. Look at that beautiful girl. Tall, blue eyes. You can see she's got noble blood in her. Just like you and me, my dear. You what? Her husband interrupted her in a whisper so loud that half the orphanage could hear him. This so-called beauty? Mr. Director said that she has a record of deviant behavior. No way, we don't want criminals in the family. Martha had no idea what deviant behavior was, but she readily believed that the director could say anything to keep certain children out of the orphanage. Of course, because of her age, Martha couldn't realize many things. For example, why did the director part with some children so easily? Why did he even try to place others? And why did he keep others with him? There had to be a logic to it, but she couldn't see it. 
However, the man's pedagogical skills could not be taken away. In that snowy December John decided to shine his directorial talent and put on a real performance of the Snow Queen. There was no role for Martha, so she sat in the auditorium. This large room with a hundred comfortable chairs, with a charming stage is another achievement of the director. Although the girl was able to see the dress rehearsal, the show itself was magnificent. Now she dreamed that someday she would also play Gerda. She liked the role very much, especially the transformation of the girl. Next to Martha in the audience were the same man and woman who had been discussing the orphans a few minutes earlier. Oh, I'd like to have Kai, the woman exclaimed. What an actor. Hear God, my dear, whispered the husband loudly. He is 10 years old. If you take a child, then the smallest, so he'd never know he was adopted. There was an indignant hissing from all sides. Martha was ready to join the voices of the disgruntled. But John had given her his strange lesson just the day before, and now she couldn't concentrate on anything. Some of the guests asked her questions, tried to get to know her, but she couldn't answer. She wandered and listened as if half asleep or in a fog. However, some guests could be persistent. After the performance, a beautiful woman with white hair and blue eyes approached her. She was accompanied by a man whom Martha immediately nicknamed in her childish head the guard. He kept looking around, adjusting his jacket every now and then. Your name is Martha, isn't it? The woman asked with a smile, sitting down. The girl nodded. My name is Aunt Selena. My lover and I were looking at the children and saw you. You are so wonderful. Would you like to have tea and chat with us? Martha wanted to answer. Yes, I was always waiting for one of the guests to take me by the hand and take me to the cupboard. We talk about everything, and then we be mother and daughter. And then we go away from here, far away, wherever the eyes could see us, but her tongue was stuck to her palate and refused to obey. So instead of a meaningful answer, she just opened and closed her mouth like a fish. What about the tea? The woman asked fearfully. You do drink tea, don't you, sweetheart? Martha remained silent, opening her mouth like a fish. Suddenly, as if out of nowhere, John appeared with his trademark smile that he always gave to his guests. He approached the beautiful woman and whispered something in her ear. But she, unlike the other adults, did not nod and move away from Martha, but reacted rather rudely. I appreciate your participation, she said, but I want to talk to Martha and I will. Anthony, bring us two cups of tea, one large and one smaller. The guard looked at the headmaster with an icy stare that made him swallow nervously. The game of staring, as Martha called it to herself, lasted five seconds at least. But John lost, he blinked, and then he pulled himself together, put on his trademark ceremonial smile like a tie, and said in his most admonishing tone. It's good that you have your own head on your shoulders, he said. But don't forget who's in charge. Next time such aggressive guests I may not let them enter the threshold of our glorious house. With these words he left, and Martha, who was a little frightened by the situation, returned to speech. The girl suddenly realized that she wanted to be like this beautiful woman when she grew up, to proudly and boldly answer the principles of all his demands, and not to whisper in her ear, but to speak out loud, so that everyone could hear. She swallowed, looked at the unfamiliar aunt, and said in a whisper, Martha, my name is Martha, I like green tea. Well, Anthony's already gone, if he brings black, I'll tell him to change it. Black's fine too, I'll take anything with sugar in it. Martha, my girl, the woman shook her hands. There was something warm and dear in that smile. They must be keeping you in a black body here. But don't be afraid, I won't bite you. We'll just talk a little, play some games. What kind of games do you like, sweetheart? Every time the invasion of guests ended, John felt an inner emptiness. On the one hand, he was flattered that his orphanage for a hundred children was the best, if not in the world, then in the country. From here, disadvantaged boys and girls come out prepared for life, if not completely, then in many ways. After all, what is the main disadvantage of orphanages? John asked the audience at meetings and seminars, telling about the advantages of his brainchild. They don't teach anything there. Caregivers cook, clean, wash and iron clothes, solve everyday problems. As a result, we get not an adult, but a big child. What a profound idea. Someone exclaimed, and the director nodded. He loved it when his words resonated with the audience. John knew, knew the issue from the inside, for he himself had grown up in an orphanage. 
years of life he would not mind erasing from his memory followed him around. Disgusting food, hard beds, violence all abounded. He became tough as a bread crust and just a stale. And at the same time, he set out to make another orphanage where things would be different. After all, unlike most of his companions, he didn't start drinking, he didn't go to jail, and he didn't become homeless. John still remembered how, as a green educator, he presented his project to a large committee with trepidation. The orphanage I see, he said at the time, it's not an orphanage at all. It's just a home. A place where the older ones take care of the younger ones, where children cook, clean, and wash themselves, and learn. After such a home, I am convinced, everyone will have a family. And where will you get the finances from? Some boss asked contemptuously, not even bothering to switch to you. John had not tolerated disrespect for his person since he was young, but then he was still forced to let such attacks pass his ears. I have an idea, he hissed that time, but I don't know which way to go, so as not to be indelicate. It was his militant attitude that caught the eye of a completely different official, who a year later gave permission for the risky project, and he never regretted his choice. Blackbird became a landmark project, which henceforth liked to record in their achievements of all sorts of officials and politicians. By that time John, a seven-year teacher training graduate, had no managerial experience. He did not know what accounting was, where food and basic necessities came from in a budget institution. But in his ideal orphanage, he saw a very different hierarchy, with one single boss. That's what was really important to John. Just him, his moms, and the junior staff. And the red-hot idea, which was approved at the top, was to manage the finances of the orphans. After all, not all boys and girls were beggars like church mice. Some had real estate behind them, others had their parents' assets. The very patron collected in his orphanage several children, no one needed at first glance, but it was because of them that there was a sum of money in the institution's accounts that could be disposed of in the interests of Blackbird. Everything was going just fine. Honor, respect, financial resources that can only dream of. But yesterday, this is unheard of, he shouted, sitting in his office. Unheard of. To think of it, John exclaimed to who knows who. These rich men, these upstarts want to take my little princess. His gold, to whom he devoted five years of his own life, and will devote even more. It was for her that he gave up his career even temporarily. It was for her that he invented new ways of teaching. And how did Martha repay him? Total betrayal. Blackbird was different from other orphanages. For example, it had its own bus that took the children on excursions or to the lake in the summer. John was able to negotiate with celebrities, actors, musicians, bloggers who visited the orphanage and worked with the kids. Not as often as he would have liked, but it was better than nothing. Martha had nothing to compare it to though. She had always lived here as long as she could remember. What were you talking to them about? The headmaster asked threateningly. Answer me quickly. I don't remember, Martha admitted honestly. It was my aunt, and I, and me, after your class. I couldn't string two words together, to be honest. The handmaster blushed and began to gulp for air, just as she had done yesterday. But he quickly pulled himself together and continued his interrogation. I hope you did not tell them our secret. John said, and in his voice the girl heard unusual notes. Is he frightened? No, Martha answered. Of course he isn't. You don't remember anything. Yes, I do. We certainly didn't talk about you, Martha said. That's good. Be good. Don't go near that on again, you hear. Why? The girl was surprised. She said she wants to take me away. To take me away, can you imagine? She wanted to tell the principal that she had hoped for a home of her own. She could already see her own room in it. A very small one, just enough to put a bed, a table, and a closet for toys and clothes. But it would be enough for her. It was not much for a person to be happy, but the headmaster was not ready to listen to her, much less to share her hope of happiness. Suppressing the urge to shout and shout, John laughed. He picked Martha up, put her on his lap, and began to tell her how conniving adults were, that they would give her hope, fill her young heart with expectation, and then betray her. It sounded convincing, because the principal is such an experienced man, and he understands literally everything. But why? Asked the girl in tears, but why? What did I do to her to make her betray me? You didn't do anything, but that's the point. They betray you just because they can. The principal replied with a smile, 
wiping the orphan's tears. Come on, repeat after me, little girl. And he began to say the words again, which gave Martha goosebumps. But then she suddenly felt good and calm, and she began to say what John wanted her to say. Even without the pill, Anthony believed that he had never really loved, and that there was no room in his heart for light feeling at all. Plus, there had been a bad experience in his life when he had gotten married, but wasn't wealthy enough for his wife. She constantly berated his service in the organs. Constant absences and duty on holidays, beggarly wages. And when Anthony was ripe for dismissal, she packed her bags and left. So he was left without service and the woman he loved. That's why Selena was his salvation. And now he had to either throw himself into the maelstrom with his head, or disappear from her life. What was the right thing to do, he hadn't decided yet. It took him three days to make sense of the information he had received at the orphanage. Then a little more time to get more. His first boss and mentor in life always said, he who has information rules the situation. I found this John frankly strange, Anthony said, sipping his coffee. And you won't believe it, I decided to dig under him. But I'm thinking, from which side to dig? You're so positive. What did you come up with? Selena asked impatiently. She admired her man, his ingenuity and selflessness. Well, I won't bore you long. I dug in from the financial side, explained the private investigator. And believe it or not, this is a very strange orphanage. Very strange. What's strange about it? Selena wondered. According to the reports, once a year the kids eat black caviar and scallops. They also eat oysters, mussels, and shrimp. You can't stop living beautifully. In recent years, this pal, I mean, John bought the orphanage an expensive bus, a telescope, a whole collection of machinery. Shall I go on? I don't know what you're getting at, darling. Selena shrugged. I don't understand anything. I think that all those delicacies and other delights do not reach the orphanage, he said. It's just written off on him. Like a lot of other expenses. Look, that doesn't tell me anything. You understand this, Selena, said the detective. If I'm risking my license, if I'm digging into this, I need to make sure you're not hiding anything from me. And you seem to be. I swear I'm not. The girl almost shouted with resentment. Where do you get such thoughts from? I'll explain, Anthony said, and reached for a cigarette. Then he remembered that his woman did not like tobacco smoke and immediately threw the pack on the table. The question is, where did this John get the money for all this entertainment? So to speak, finances that can be obtained from somewhere and then either spent on luxuries or written off. From where? Selena asked. Anthony scratched his chin thoughtfully. Either his woman really didn't know anything, or she was skillfully feigning surprise. However, in the six months they'd been together, he'd gotten to know her inside and out. And she was a terrible liar. Should I believe her? Jump into the deep end? Your niece, this Myrtle Martha, has a huge inheritance, the detective explained. John can't use it directly, but he has the right to dispose of it for the benefit of the ward. I wouldn't have memorized it myself, the lawyers explained it to me. Inheritance. Selena began to dig into her memory. Right, how could she not have thought of that? She and Maddie had lost their mother early. Their various fathers had taken care of them, but without fanaticism. None of their relatives would have left them the kind of capital to buy buses, telescopes, and black caviar. The inheritance must have gone to Mady's husband. He was a strange and mysterious man, she knew nothing about him. Manny hid him just like she hid her little daughter. Understand, Anthony, Selena said with a sigh. I just want to take Myrtle for myself. Or Martha, whatever they call her. It doesn't matter to me now. I love that girl very much. And I don't give a damn about her money, no matter how much of it there is. Let that John, as you call him, take it and choke on it. We'll go back to Washington. We'll paint with Myrtle, teach her to skate. Wouldn't that be nice, Anthony? Okay, you've convinced me, smiled the detective. Well, or I want to believe it myself. Only if we're in the game, we'll go all the way. And we won't leave that director a dime. And money, you know, you can find a worthy use for it. What do you mean? Selena was surprised. Do you need money? Anthony, we don't mean anything. My paintings are selling, you have clients. Is it too much for a man to be happy? You realize this isn't about me. It's about principles. Why should your niece's money end up in the pockets of some tricksters? When there are those who really deserve it. I don't see where you are going with this, shook her head. Don't be afraid, my dear, I have a plan. I've thought it over carefully, 
consulted with lawyers. What kind of plan? You will definitely like the beginning, Anthony said and got down on his knee in front of Selena. Angelica valued her time literally every minute of it. For 10 years of her life she had been working toward her goal of becoming a lawyer. First, five years of intense study at the university. Then three years of hard labor as a court clerk. After all, this is the most disgusting place on the planet, especially if you are at the bottom of the system. Writing reports, sending out sapunas, listening to endless claims on the phone. Then there were two years of interning at the bar and trying to pass the exam. And when her dream came true, Angelica realized how little time she had left to enjoy life and reached the top of the profession. For 10 years now, she has not just been developing, but becoming a better person. Angelica valued her time, so her rates could not be called democratic. Rather the opposite, the prices were very authoritarian. But there was a simple explanation. Angelica approached every situation with a manic desire to win. She used any method to achieve her goal, and she always won. Why did you choose me? She asked, looking at the charming blonde. There was something creative about her, in her eyes, in her hair, in her gestures. It's not my specialty. You were recommended, the client shrugged. They said you were the only one who could handle such a complicated case. Said you were the best lawyer around. Lawyer, she corrected with a smile. She didn't like being called the man's word for her profession. But it didn't change the point, unfortunately. Family disputes are a gray area of justice. A lot of things you might read in clever books don't really work, or it doesn't work at all. Angelica wasn't about to give up her job. A new and interesting case where you can show both erudition and creativity. What could be more beautiful? She was just padding her price. A lawyer always did that to show her clients her own importance. And she also did not like those colleagues who from the first minutes radiated confidence and success. No, luck loves not only prepared, but also cautious. On the contrary, it is necessary to sow in the soul of the client complete hopelessness. And then victory will be really desirable for him. In jurisprudence, you can never be 100% sure of anything. No two disputes are the same, which means that at any moment something can go wrong. Well, Angelica said, after reading the documents, the case does look hopeless. You do realize that if the educational institution denied you custody at the very beginning of the process, it seems a bit presumptuous to go to court. There is one trump card up my sleeve, came the voice of the man whom Angelica had first taken for a wordless security guard. He looked really solid, like an Italian gangster or a successful businessman from the 90s. Not even one trump card, but several. Well, Kali said the lawyer with a note of irritation. All the trump cards should be on my desk, and then I myself will say which ones can be used and which ones not. You see, Selena tried to ease the tension. We have a suspicion that Martha is my niece. So run a DNA test, Angelica shrugged. My God, we live in the 21st century, it's so easy. We've already consulted specialists, Selena said. You see my late sister Madi, Bertel's mother. I mean, Martha was my half-sister. We have different fathers. And in this situation, a DNA test. What was it they said, Anthony? The test may not be informative, the man helped her. Angelica wondered. Not so long ago she'd have faced a similar situation and knew from her own experience that it was not easy to prove kinship in this case. Moreover, it will not always serve as an unconditional basis for the transfer of the child to the alleged relative. What other trumps are there? She asked. The case was beginning to interest her more and more. You see, Selena said, we went to John's house to negotiate. He was the one who invited us, and he said things that are hard to believe. We don't know how children are usually taken into custody, but there's something wrong. What happened in there? The lawyer asked. She thought she should give her new clients a quote before she got too caught up in the story and was persuaded to lower her fee. Oh, I'll tell you all about it. On New Year's Eve, the Blackbird Orphanage was charming. The main entrance was decorated with Christmas trees, garlands, colorful ribbons, and reindeer figures. Zavhaus with children molded a real Santa Claus out of snow and painted him with red and blue paint. The orphanage was used as an amulet by officials of all stripes to assure even higher authorities that the work to protect childhood was being done at the proper level. Did you think well? John asked his guests and smiled as sincerely as he could. Yes, Selena replied. My husband and I have thought it over carefully. We want to take custody of Martha. We like her very much. Don't we, Anthony? 
Yeah, he nodded, very much. Oh, I wouldn't advise it, said the principal thoughtfully. Why would you young people want to ruin your lives with a troubled child? You see, I've been through so many children and adoptive parents that I can guess at a glance whether everything will go according to plan. His orphanage was supposed to be top-notch, so he held conversations with present and future guardians and adopters not in the hall on a bench, but in a real meeting room, which he arranged at the expense of sponsorship funds. A neat white table, soft armchairs, air conditioning, a cooler with clean water, all of this was conducive to productive communication. John believed that he could convince anyone of his righteousness, and in such a favorable atmosphere. Mr. Director, Celine said, holding back an inner rush of rage. We're not saying we have to take her into our family right now. We're from out of town, as you pointed out at the open house. But we're not sure on funds. We rented an apartment here, bought a crib. Anthony's already looking for a job. He's in demand. Oh, young and green. You see, it's not about material objects. The Blackbird has the best facilities in the country, I assure you. The children have everything, and it's unlikely you'll be able to give them more. You don't have to. Martha is just a very difficult child. The director was silent for a moment, as if savoring his own words. You know, I have a special, sentimental feeling for her. She came here when Blackbird was only six months old. What happened to her parents? Salim asked. Oh, don't ask. The director waved her off. I won't tell you anyway. You realize we can't divulge confidential information. Well, Martha literally grew up in my arms. When I built this house, I was young and romantic. I felt like I could replace a family for the little ones. We appreciate your candor, the girl interrupted him, but I still haven't gotten an answer. Don't interrupt, listen to me. The director demanded, no respect. So in all the years I've watched Martha grow up, alas, no optimism. She has no friends. She has no hobbies. She has no interest in anything. As you can see, she can barely talk. She'll need constant supervision, I'm afraid, even after she comes of age. Are you prepared for that? Won't you come running back to me in six months and ask me to take things back to the way they were? We are not afraid of difficulties, Selena interrupted him. I really don't know how to convince you, I swear. But we're ready to work with Martha. She's got me really hooked. Right, Anthony? Oh, Ren John. He saw that soft persuasion was not working and decided to use hard force. You think you've come to this neck of the woods and you can buy everything? Well, you should know that there are some things that are not for sale. And one of those things is my goodwill towards mommy and daddy. If you want to be Martha's guardians, my answer is no. There was silence. If Anthony was prepared for such a development, it was as if a bucket of ice water had been poured on Selena. She was suddenly cold and shivering. The man took her hand with the wedding ring but even that had no calming effect. We're going to court, the girl whispered. She couldn't believe her ears. We'll complain everywhere, everywhere. Do what you want, the principal waved his hand. Complain where? To the media. The information is confidential, I've said it many times. If you make the story public, you'll never be able to take in a child in your life, not only to take in a child, but to set foot on the threshold of the orphanage. You've thought of everything, Selena whispered again. But why? Oh, don't try to flatter me. However, I am an educator, and an educator with a great deal of experience. That's why I'm offering you something else. Listen to me, listen carefully. I'm not going to suggest it again. Martha replayed the events of that strange day and realized that the aunt with the white hair had to be given a chance. Yes, she could betray. And she could indeed give hope first, and then throw it away. To know whether she would do the right thing or not, it was necessary to trust her. That was what Martha was going to do. A week after meeting her beautiful aunt, who had told her a lot about home and family, Martha became very ill. She literally went to bed. On the first night the temperature rose to 40 degrees, and her mother, wooing and aying, even wanted to call an ambulance. But John strictly forbade it. He ordered to take measures to quarantine their cell, no one to let anyone out for three days, do not use phones. What's wrong with phones? The teacher wondered. These are children. They sit on their phones all the time. They eat, eat, even go to the toilet. And when you call, they don't pick up the phone. They can't hear. Tony, have you heard of TikTok? John asked in his arrogant voice. Well, answered the teacher. You don't want a video of sick kids from Blackbird, as they say. Go viral? Go trending? The mother educator clapped her eyes shut. About TikTok, of course, she had heard. 
but the rest of the clever words did not know at all. However, by the principal's tone, the correct answer was becoming obvious. No, of course not, she replied. I don't want any viruses or any of those. Mr. John Helter, the rector. Unlike his subordinate, he didn't look frightened. And not only because a short-term rise in temperature above 40 degrees was not dangerous to the child's health, it was just that so far everything was going exactly according to his plan. And John liked it when he wasn't just in control of a situation, but in control of it. After waiting a week after the unfortunate conversation with the arrogant blonde and her asshole, the principal ordered an outdoor physical education class. And right afterwards, he treated Martha to blueberry ice cream, her favorite treat. Now the main thing was not to overdo it, to control the girl's condition. She better be sick for a month, no less. He took a nursing course at the pedagogical university. With them he was able to work part-time in the evenings and nights at the local hospital as an orderly. Excellent experience, although the work is disgusting. However, as young John did not ask his temporary colleagues to call him a nurse, they did not listen to his requests. Even in his workbook, they wrote his profession as a nurse with a sneer. He could forgive the disrespect then, but not now. He took Martha to the medical isolation room, listened to the girl with his own foam endoscope, lungs without wheezing, normal, just the flu. He thought back again to the unfortunate conversation with Selena and tried to figure out what he'd done wrong. I'm an educator, and I hope that my name will be written in golden letters in the history of pedagogy, he said. So I propose to take another little boy from my orphanage. Look, his name is Carlos. He's a golden boy. Smart, obedient, no congenital diseases or malformations. And he has. John looked intently at Anthony. He has eyes like your man's. We don't need another baby. Selena cut Selena off. We came for Martha, and we're going to leave with her. You must understand an important thing. John said in as dry a voice as possible. Blackbird is me, and I alone decide who leaves here and when. I'll give a negative opinion on your application for Martha, the director shrugged, and you'll leave here the same way you came in. The conversation was over. Then he rose from his chair and left the meeting room. The hidden video camera continued to record the situation, and Celine seemed ready to say whatever she thought about the director's intransigence. At least that's what John was counting on. But the Muzzy did the strangest thing. He just put his arm around his wife and kissed her hotly. Sneaky move. The director took Martha's temperature again. It's a bit high, 40 degrees. It needs to be brought down. He stirred an algin and other ingredients, prepared a triplet, and treated the girl's thigh. He liked her. All small, beautiful princess, and he was not ready to share her with anyone. The injection was painful. Even though John was holding Martha, Anthony wrinkled his nose. He remembered how during the service not only caught criminals, but also had to prove that they had broken the law. More than once or twice, he had been subpoenaed and questioned literally to the point of unconsciousness. How did you get to the criminal? How did you detain him? Did you read him his rights? The most frustrating thing was when Anthony's answers didn't satisfy the judge or the prosecutor. Then the criminal could be acquitted, and he, the operator, deprived of a bonus or even another rank. Yeah, I've been there, Anthony said. I'll tell you this, the main thing in court is not to say too much. Only what they want to hear from you. How do I know what they want to hear? Selena asked. Angela will probably explain everything to us. And tell us. Angela? The girl was indignant. That's what you call her. Do you know her? Oh, I'm sorry, honey. No, let's talk about it right away, so there's no confusion, Anthony said. It's okay, I'm not offended. I call all the women who play on our side as family. Do you understand? Besides, putting you and her next to each other. Well, the choice is obvious, I guess. Selena now felt bad for raising her voice to her husband. She still couldn't understand how he dared to propose to her. And not only had he proposed, but he had organized the wedding the very next day. Of course, she had imagined her wedding differently. A lavish dress, veil, guests, photographer. But, in fact, who could she call? She had no friends here, no family. Anthony, you know, you came into my life like a lottery prize. I'm gonna worry all the time that I won you by mistake, or that you'll be stolen. You believe that? The private investigator was embarrassed by sentimentality, and in his previous work, he was used to hiding emotions. You always have to be the brave and strong guy who wins no matter what, and stress is relieved either with alcohol or racing through the Washington night. 
I had to get used to a new way of life, respectable, exemplary. I want you and me to talk about this, he said, and think about whether Angela, sorry, Angelica, needs to know. What is it? She asked. While we were in there, I went out for a smoke. Can you believe this orphanage even has a smoking room? For guests with pipes, no less. But you know, I was working a little bit. I talked to one of the staff. And what did she tell you? You see, she thought I was a policeman, so she confessed me like a priest. It doesn't sound very believable. But then again, why would she lie to me? The sickness was disgusting. It was as if Martha were in a whirlpool, surfacing and sinking to the bottom again. The high fever would go away at times, and she would feel almost fine. Then the amulet returned with renewed vigor, nailing her to the bed. Martha didn't worry for a second about not going to class, not seeing the other girls and the other students. The woman with white hair, whose name she whispered in delirium, was another matter. Selini, for some reason it seemed eerily familiar and familiar to her. It was also very hard for her because none of her classmates had come to support her. They didn't even give her a note. The principal forbade her to use the phone and tablet. He said that it was harmful during such an illness. Only her mom looked in every hour or two, touched her forehead and sighed. But John himself was always around and always in a great mood. For the first few days he literally slept in the next bed, taking her temperature twice a night. He gave her nasty syrups and powders, brought her freshly brewed cranberry morsels. He helped her up to the toilet. Thank God, he didn't go into forbidden territory. He was very involved and polite in a way she'd never seen him before. I'll never leave you, John said. I will always be with you. Those words, which in another situation would have made her shiver, were appropriate this time. It turned out that the director knew as well as a doctor about various pills and injections. On the third day, however, the doctor came to see her and praised John for his treatment. It's obviously the flu, he said. We should monitor her temperature and bring it down if it rises above 30 day and a half. Throat rinses, plenty of water, antiviral capsules. Doctor, Martha wheezed. How long am I going to be sick? God willing, you'll be fine on the fifth day, the doctor smiled. Listen to John. You'd be lost without him. Oh, what a mentor. Blackbird is very lucky to have such a wonderful owner living and working here. Martha didn't ask her question about the length of her illness out of curiosity. She was just trying to calculate how many days Selena, her new mother, would be waiting for her. Perhaps a week would be enough for her. But what about two? What about three? There's no way to know for sure. Adults can act like children sometimes. If you stay here in total isolation for more than a week, you'll see all sorts of reactions. Selena must think Martha's a rude, arrogant girl for not even calling or writing her. She didn't know her mom to be phone number though. John, the girl whispered as the headmaster returned to her makeshift room. Where's Selena? Did she ask about me? Did you remember her name? The man shouted, which startled Martha, but he pulled himself together. Sure she did. She went through the children like kittens at a fair. This one's puny, and this one's got angry eyes. Terrible woman. So I sent her away. This news immediately made Martha feel worse. She had another high fever that didn't go away for a week. By the time she recovered, she was so exhausted that she could only eat oatmeal from a spoon and drink it with sour cream. The memory of the beautiful woman with white hair now seemed like a dream. John, on the other hand, had become much more likable to her. She was even willing to forgive his constant rudeness and their strange activities. She was also willing to hope that her mom would come to see her again. After all, she's only eight years old. Now she's going to study hard, pull up math and geography, learn to write poetry, and act in the next play, of course. Then there'll be no shortage of potential parents. Selena was in court for the first time. Angelica convinced her that they had to act quickly, and then they would have at least a minimal chance of success. Selena sent several letters and packages to the orphanage. She set up an exemplary Facebook page. And yet, going to court. Selena had always thought it was a very dark place where hopes and dreams were dashed. She had no idea how the sessions went, what to say, or why the judges wore such ridiculous robes. When they met at the courthouse on the day of the hearing, Angelica was in a great mood. She felt like a fish in water in this state house. You have no idea how lucky we are, the lawyer said. The hearing was scheduled only three weeks after the lawsuit was filed. I don't think they'll delay the decision either. She didn't mention that she had to use a certain amount of leverage. Other lawsuits had taken months to resolve without any hope of speed. 
but her clients, by some strange coincidence, were always lucky. Selena was afraid. If a decision was made in the next few days, what if it wasn't in her favor? What should we say? Selena asked, how should we behave? I will speak, Angelica said, and her tone seemed a little arrogant. If they ask questions, think about what the judge wants to hear. You are a positive family, without bad habits. I said that you are probably the legendary director of the Blackbird, Angelica smiled. I've heard a lot about you. Masty, John replied, and you must represent the very madman I denied custody of one of my wards. The solicitor nodded. She didn't want to continue the conversation and waste her energy. She also couldn't stand it when a hearing was delayed. Therefore, she requested that the trials with her participation be held in the morning. The case was entrusted to Sela Verstova, an experienced judge with a long experience. She had already gone to her trials. The feelings were mixed. The secretary said loudly, and Angelica immediately showed her her ID and warrant. Please proceed to room four. Selena, who was in court for the first time, was impressed by the design of the room. High ceilings, a counter like in American movies, beautiful benches. Near the judge's table lazily settled down the prosecutor, an elderly man who was almost lying on his chair. Was all this huge hall for the sake of their little case? Such a matter could well have been settled in the tiniest office. John, on the other hand, seemed to have been in such surroundings. He laid out his papers, set his expensive clipboard in front of him, turned off his phone. He looked at Selena and Anthony and smiled the ugliest smile he could muster. A separate door opened for the judge. She entered the room, took her seat in the high chair. The prosecutor stood at attention, and the other participants rose as well. The trial has begun. Parties, we are hearing the case in closed session, said the judge. Photography and videotaping are prohibited. And for disclosure of information you could be prosecuted, the prosecutor will not lie. Returning to the team was made even more difficult by the fact that Harry had been taken into foster care. The same naughty girl who's now 10 years old. She started a social networking page where she happily posted pictures from her new life. Here is her charming bedroom. Here are the toys her new parents gave her, albeit not age appropriate. Hi Martha, said Harry when they called via video. Are you feeling better? Oh, I don't know, Martha replied. It all happened so fast. You and the family. Don't worry, they'll take you too, the former classmate said confidently. The main thing is to stick to your line. How did it happen? And she told the amazing story of her departure to the family. When the volunteers and guests arrived, Harry hid on the second floor out of habit. She did so for several years, after she lost hope of finding a family. There she sat in her tablet, lazily scrolling through her social media feed. Suddenly some couple approached her. It's like we're on the same page, you know? Harry said excitedly. We understand each other like nobody else. They're IT guys. Martha didn't know what that was, but she was pleased with her classmate. The conversation with her had taken a lot of energy, and she had to lie down on the bed to rest a little. Classes had started a long time ago, and once again she hadn't attended them, so she would fall behind in math, geography, and English again. She sat down at the table, took out her textbooks and began to read them, and if something was unclear, she looked for a video lecture on YouTube and tried to figure it out. It turned out that the internet was not only funny videos and crazy pictures. Uncle Tanans from the small screen could explain any topic as well as her teachers. And now she finally understood fractions even though the math teacher had spent a lot of effort trying to convey these mysteries to her. Excited, Martha didn't even notice that she had been studying for two hours. Soon she would not only catch up with her class, but also surpass it. The important thing was to be diligent, and then she would be taken into foster care for sure, if even Harry was taken away. Suddenly Martha felt so sad that she cried. It turns out that here in the orphanage, they are all competitors. Boys and girls have to do everything in order to be taken to the foster family. Jump high, run fast, participate in theater productions. Is that who she should study hard for, for herself or for her future mom and dad? In the doorway of the living room, Mama showed up. Ah, there you are, Martha. She splashed her hands. The woman was suffering, looking at the illness of her ward and therefore wanted to cheer her up. Don't cry. I'll tell you something you won't believe and you'll definitely feel better right away. The court hearing was all jumbled up in Selena's head. She remembered everything that had happened during the first half of the day in fragments. Here, the judge read out the case file and asked if they supported their claims. 
Here came the defense attorney and made a fiery speech about how her confidence wanted to do their part to eradicate the institution of orphanhood. Here heard objections from John. Then each of them was asked questions, the prosecutor being the most diligent. Tell me, he said to Selena, why did you choose this child? Why do you want custody of him? Your honor, let me answer, Angelica said and, without waiting for permission, spoke immediately. The question is somewhat sentimental, and yet, my confidant had a sister. After her death, she tried for a long time to find traces of her niece Murda Lansky. And then, quite by chance, while visiting another orphanage, she discovers Martha Lansky. That's an interesting coincidence, the judge perked up. Was there a question of proof of parentage? Your honor, the lawyer said, the child spent a long six years in an orphanage. Any drastic action can traumatize a child's psyche. That's why my confidence decided to act step by step, first to establish friendship and then to confirm the kinship, if they do develop a strong friendship. Besides, the kids know nothing but the orphanage. Leaving it quickly could be painful. Reasonable, agreed the judge. Then let's ask the thrush question. Tell me, representative of the defendant, have you previously tried to find the girl's relatives? As part of standard procedures, John replied, I have a hundred pupils and pupils, that's without taking into account the dynamics, and I don't have an additional specialist on staff to deal with correspondence and such nonsense. The judge nodded and made a note in her papers. Then the woman in the row spent a long time reading out characterizations, looking at photographs, reading out certificates. It seemed to Cellini that the judge was looking at her with maternal sadness. At least, she would have liked to believe that. Will there be any additions? The judge asked. That's right, said the Blackbird director. I realize that Martha is only eight years old and that by law her opinion should not be taken into account in resolving such disputes. But nevertheless, I ask you to read and attach to the case the letter that my pupil wrote. Not paying attention to the secretary, John himself approached the judge, and she even had to tap with a mallet for decency. Actually, the secretary works with us, she said, pointing to the girl in front of the computer. All papers should be passed through her, and other participants of the process can familiarize themselves with the documents. I'm sorry, shrugged the principal, I'm just a teacher, not a lawyer. And in my work I think first of all about the welfare of children, not about all these legal curtsies. The judge sighed, picked up the letter with the child's sprawling handwriting and began to read it out. Some of the phrases seemed too mature to Selena. After a minute, she wanted to jump up and run out of the room, but Anthony grabbed her arm. Tears poured down her cheeks. Among the children's text, Selena only memorized a few sentences. Blackbird, this is my second home. I am loved, accepted, and welcomed here. John didn't approve of the guardians, and he's like a father to me. Please don't give me to them, Conray Judge. Recess, the judge thundered. A recess for rest. We'll continue after lunch. Martha couldn't believe her ears. It turned out that John had once again deceived her, and Selena not only wanted to take her away, but even decided to go to court. What that is, the girl only knew roughly, it must be a place where naughty principals are forced to give their children to moms and dads if they really want them. But why? Martha asked the teacher's mom. Why did he do that? Oh, don't ask, the woman waved her hand. What are we? Small, unintelligent people, and John's the head. Look at the orphanage he's built. I drove miles to work here. I still don't get it, Martha said. There's nothing to understand. The teacher waved her hand. I see you're doing math here, aren't you? That's good. All she'd seen on the kids' tablets before were endless videos, games, and stupid tests. One boy in her group, who'd been taken into foster care a long time ago, read books and played chess, but that was more of an exception to the rule. Looking at Martha, she realized she didn't belong here either. She was too different from the other girls. Martha, do you remember anything about yourself? The teacher asked the girl to keep her busy. About your mom and dad? Where did you come from? Martha began to dig into her memory. At times the image did come to her. A big stuffed hair, a crib with high sides, and the black car in which she had been driven. Where it all went, where it all disappeared to, she couldn't understand. John said that if you were well enough, you should come and see him, the teacher said, her eyes downcast. Can I not go? Martha asked. Can you say I'm still sick? You know, my dear, that it is a sin to deceive adults. Besides, the principal will find out anyway. Go on, he won't do anything so bad to you. Go on. Then Martha thought she'd go to see him, 
but not to participate in his stupid class. No, she tried to find out everything. Why she was here, why he had taken Aunt Selena away, and how long she would languish in the Blackbird. After the break, Selena's composure returned to her, and she remembered the events that followed well. Despite her lowered mood, Angelica had explained to her. Everything was going fine. Some unknown way she could read the judge's mood and deduce whether it suited them or not. I don't want to get your hopes up, she smiled, but this Blue Sparrow's position is very weak. What do you mean? Selena asked. He's worried about child protection, the lawyer explained. But what kind of childhood is there in this orphanage? Just an imitation. Family is another matter. Anthony, did you get your trunk card out of your pocket? Yeah, her husband nodded, waiting over there at the end of the hallway, reading the papers. Didn't that raven see it? No, Anthony answered. He doesn't see anything further than his beak. Here again jealousy pricked Selena's heart. Indeed, while she and Angelica were having coffee and puffs, Anthony had been off somewhere. She thought it was for a smoke, and it turns out that they have their own secrets. But the girl was able to restrain herself and did not begin to find out the relationship. After all, you can do it a little later. The session continued. After lunch, the judge clearly looked more satisfied and relaxed. She reviewed the papers once more, clarified some questions from the parties, and was clearly deciding if there was enough evidence to end the trial. As suddenly, will the parties have any further additions? The judge asked, let it be known to you that it is inadmissible to refer to evidence that was not the subject of the trial and complaints. Your Honor, said the lawyer in her expensive voice, before we proceed to the debate and you retire to the deliberation room, the plaintiff has a motion. Yes, said the judge. We request, no, we request the examination of a witness whose testimony may play a critical role in the resolution of this case. She called the name, and the director nervously adjusted his tie. I object, he shouted, objection. Order, the judge called for order and banged her gavel. The plaintiff's side had not yet finished reading its motion. Your Honor, counsel continued. The witness's appearance has been secured, and to preserve certain aspects of privacy. I would ask that the witness be questioned in the absence of the parties. Objection. John shouted again. This is a gross violation of a child's rights. How can you interrogate this decrepit old woman in my absence? The court decided to grant the motion in part, the judge said, to examine the witness in the presence of the plaintiff and the defendant. Betty entered the hall shuffling. She had come a long way and her strength was almost gone. The janitor approached the podium and squinted trying to see through the veil of her old age to the judge in the big black robe. Do you realize who I am where you are? Huh? Betty interjected. Yes, I think I do. I'll tell you everything, the whole story. The orphanage director turned pale and clutched his desk with both hands as if the whole world was falling away from under his feet. Two days before the fateful court hearing, his subordinates had already stabbed John in the back. To think that he, the writer and director of the play called Blackbird, betrayed in the most insidious way. Now all his efforts to build a trusting relationship with Martha were in vain. And if she found out he'd taken her name and surname. You're not going to court, the principal shouted. I'll fire the teacher's mother, I swear. As soon as I find a replacement for her. To think she disobeyed his orders. Told Martha that not only had Selena not given up her claim to his little treasure, but she'd gone to court. Hired a lawyer, that smug woman in the suit. No, he's not going down without a fight. And as long as the girl is in his power, it's too soon to give up. Write a waiver. The principal demanded it. Write that you're not going anywhere, or you know what will happen. I won't, Martha insisted. I really like my mom. We had tea and talked. I did math today. You've only seen her once, John said. You've known me all your life. Have I ever lied to you? Have I ever betrayed you? Martha wondered. Yes, the handmaster had been polite and kind to her, even if he had been stern at times. But what did she really know about him? I won't agree, the girl said. I can't deceive anyone, John. And then the headmaster decided to change tactics. If Martha was no longer afraid of brute force, why not outwit her? Let's do it this way, he asked. You do realize I can't lose this trial. Well, that's the kind of man I am. Let the judge say no, and I'll let this woman come here any time of the day. I'll let her draw with you. What do you say? You really won't deceive me? The girl asked helpfully. Of course not. 
After these words, she thought that better a tit in the sleeve than a crane in the sky. Sitting down at the director's huge desk, she wrote everything he dictated to her on a white sheet of paper, without a single mistake or a blunder. After rereading the text, the director smacked his lips and put the piece of paper into his briefcase. And now, shall we have our lesson now? I don't want to. We'll only reinforce what we've learned, smiled the principal. Betty leaned against the door and couldn't believe her ears. There he was, the golden man. Here he was, the outstanding educator and innovator. Putting a girl on his lap and telling her such terrible things. The cleaning lady even clutched at her heart, so embarrassed and hurt by what was happening. You'll grow up to be mine, John said. We were made for each other. I've made up my mind. As soon as you turn 17, we'll apply for a marriage license, do you hear me? Martha was silent. Tears were running down her cheeks. All girls her age already know what a registry office, a wedding, a bride and groom are. But was this director really her future husband? Would she have to live with him until she died? You're mine. You're mine. You're mine. You're mine. John said in a chant, as if entering some kind of trance. I am yours, Martha repeated, tears streaming down her cheeks. I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. This strange mantra went on for 15 minutes at least. Gently she slipped away from the door, and with a shuffling gait, she went to the ward room to get ready to go home. The headmaster was so engrossed in his next class that he didn't even hear her footsteps. There was silence in the courtroom. The eyes of the prosecutor, the judge, and the lawyer were fixed on the jander. The burgundy face of the principal was an eloquent indication that Betty's words might well be true. It's this is unheard of, the woman in the row whispered. Here's a cross for you, granddaughter. The cleaning lady shouted and crossed herself. And when John finally collected his thoughts and rose from his seat to object, he was rudely interrupted. A German, said the judge, and looked expressively at the prosecutor. The hearing will continue the day after tomorrow at 10 o'clock. As soon as the judge went to her separate door, John began to quickly collect the papers and put the expensive clipboard into his leather briefcase. The prosecutor came running up to him with an unprecedented swiftness for his size and age. Where are you going? He asked. I need to talk to you urgently. Let's just say I need to ask you a few questions. About what? The director snapped at me. I don't intend to answer any questions. Guess what? The prosecutor shouted. He was gripping John's forearm tightly with his left hand and dialing someone on the phone with his right. Their struggle didn't last long. At some point, the principal slumped in his chair and rested his head on the table. I'm doomed, he whispered. Anthony triumphed. Let's go, Angelica said. Hurry up, we've been asked to clear the hall. What happens now? Selena asked, what happens now? Be patient, said the lawyer. In the evening, Anthony and Selena went for a walk around the city. Although they had already celebrated New Year's Eve, the festive mood was still in the air. Everywhere garlands, ribbons, large lighted figures, Santa Clauses, like lagging travelers from the train, continued to amuse the public. This festive atmosphere dispelled Selena's sad thoughts a little, what her little girl had to go through. Even in the most beautiful orphanage, with the most modern equipment and advanced ideas, the ghosts of the past could dwell. Will her niece ever be able to get rid of them? Blackbird came into motion and seemed ready to take off. Frederick had taken all the children on his bus and four trips to endless excursions, exhibitions, and plays. The corridors and offices were filled with completely different people. It's impossible to know for sure what they were looking for. They themselves will never talk about their findings. Unless some information leaks to the press, but can it be believed? Two days later, Celine was ready for the endless trial again, but this time by a strange coincidence, the trial took a minimum of time. John's seat was taken by a woman of indeterminate age. She looked simple. An old jacket, a long shawl, a discreet hairdo. And yet there was something about her that made her appealing. The table in front of her was empty, with only an open diary on it. Your Honor, said the nice woman. At the previous court hearing, the former director of the orphanage had already spoken. Having carefully studied the documents, we regarded his position as erroneous. Certainly, the plaintiffs deserved the opportunity to become the guardians of our charming girl. So, you recognize the claim? The judge asked. In full, nodded the woman. The only thing we ask not to collect court costs. If such a requirement will be stated, 
we are a budgetary institution and therefore do not have the means to pay expensive lawyers. No such claims have been filed yet, the judge said. They will be considered as they come in. When the judge read out her ruling in a high-pitched voice, Selena didn't understand the thing. Lawyers must have been taught their own special language, like doctors. But from the lawyer's shining face, she realized that they had achieved their goal. What now? Selena asked. When can I take Martha home? Not so fast, Angelica smiled. You'll have to visit her a few times a week now. Study with her, play with her, take part in her training. Once a month you can get out into the city. Go to the theater or the circus, to a cafe, to the movies. If all will be satisfied, then in a year it will be possible to solve the issue of cohabitation. A whole year, exclaimed the girl. No, don't think. I'm not complaining. It's just that it all took too long. Perhaps I was not ready for it. Fortunately, you didn't make a mistake in choosing the representative. Of course, the case was a little more scandalous than it first appeared. But that's the beauty of it. What's going to happen to John? Selena asked. Will he go to jail? I don't know, Angelica shrugged. That's not my problem. You see, Selena, you don't have to hate him. You have to feel sorry for him. The man really did go to great lengths to find a family. Trying to build one the best way he knows how. But the truth is, you can't get your happiness from someone else's grief. Speaking of happiness, who can we talk to about finances? You or your husband? That year, Santa Claus was a little late with his gift. It was already February. The mountains of snow collected in December had almost melted when a beautiful aunt and her husband visited her. The girl was over the moon. At first, she was afraid to talk to her new mother. Martha was timid and could not say two words. But Aunt Selena was persistent. She seemed interested in everything. Most of all, she was interested in drawing, which she called painting. She gave her brushes and paints, and at the first opportunity they sought a private corner to be alone together. Anthony was good too, though Martha found it hard to call him daddy. The girl drew him as a knight who protected his beautiful ladies. Life at the Blackbird had changed too. John disappeared as if he didn't exist at all. One day he was, the next day he was gone. A woman with the beautiful name of Leslie took his place. She smiled all the time when she looked at her children. She no longer required them to clean, cook or do laundry. But Martha didn't like this change. You only have to wait a little longer, my girl, Selena said. Soon we will go to see your room. Are you happy? Martha thought that the pictures of her new room would definitely not be shown to anyone. Not even for a thousand likes. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.